Welcome to the Garden Cinema and congratulations for your six BAFTA nominations and also the overall success of the film, not only in terms of box office, but also the way that people have connected to it and have reacted. Um, whilst you were making it, were you aware of that you were making something special or it would touch a nerve? Well, you hope that you're making something that's going to touch a nerve and be special. I, do you know what? I never, ever expect anybody to actually want to go and see the film I've made. You hope they do. Um, and with this one, I was really nervous, I think. I'd made the last film I made, Lean on Pete, sort of sort of came out and sort of disappeared. And, and I was like, oh, God, I don't want this to do the same thing. And I think especially because I knew it was personal and I knew that there was a lot of me in it. It somehow puts more pressure on it when it comes out. I just think, God, if it's just a disaster and everyone hates it, it just means they hate me. And then I don't know how I move forward from that. But um, when I was making it, I kind of felt like something was happening. Like, you know, when you shoot a scene, sometimes the crew is not listening and they're looking around and doing nothing. But we would do scenes this time and like the crew would be, you know, physically affected by it um, and would want to share their stories about their own childhood and their own life and their own relationships. I thought, okay, it's doing something. Um, and then, But then you work on it and then you sort of, I really was happy to start with and then you lose faith in it a little bit. And it was a long edit process, it, you know, it takes to quite a long time and you have a lot of notes and we had a preview and, you know, I don't like things like that. Um, and so you sort of doubt it again. But then when it, you know, now that it's out, I'm like, yeah, thank God. That's a story, that's a long answer. But So the other thing is, all of our strangers and also your previous film, 45 Years, um, you are unafraid to go to awkward spaces and confront painful feelings. And this is quite remarkable, especially at a time where we are all numbing ourselves through social media and we're distracting ourselves. How intentional you are um, creating this space for the audience to, to experience difficult feelings? Yeah, I mean, I just don't understand why you wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> because, I mean, look, there's room for... Um, you know, optimistic films full of like happiness and joy. I get it. And there's room for things that <laughs> that are, you know, completely just take you away from your everyday life. But if that's the only thing that's being made, I, I just don't I don't understand it. Um, you know, if you go to an art gallery and you look around, it's not full of joy and optimism. It's full of like pain <laughs> and suffering and agony. And and the reason we like going to an art gallery is because it speaks to the fact that we all go through very difficult things. So for me, it just makes no sense to not like stare into the like the pain of things and try and unpick it. And in doing that, it makes everyone feel, I think, a little better. Like if I watch something that 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 affects me emotionally, I feel better, not worse, by feeling like, oh yeah, I get it. Everyone everyone loses, everyone grieves, everyone everyone struggles with intimacy and love and all those kind of things. So yeah, I yeah, to me there's no other option. Well, it depends on the film because sometimes people explore difficult feelings and, and it becomes miserable. But with your film, it's cathartic because you take us through a journey and in the end, because of the authenticity of the relationship, we, f we feel that we went through the other side in a way. I mean, I think <coughs> I think I am relatively optimistic as a person. So, I mean, I don't know if that's actually true, but I still feel like that in my films is someone trying to find a way out of a feeling uh, rather than trying to wallow in a feeling. So they're not descending into complete misery. They are searching through. It doesn't mean that everyone gets there or finds it or, or achieves it. But I think every every character is trying to find a way out of things. Um, so I think that's probably why it feels like it's not too miserable. Yeah. So the performances you you get um, from uh, Scott and Mescal are outstanding. What was your casting process? Yeah, you. It's a funny one now because you know you you when when we were had the script finished, I didn't think of them when I was writing it at all. Um, I don't think of people, you know, actors. It just I can't. I don't want to sort of have someone else's head, you know, face in mind when I'm writing really. Um, in case you don't get them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, you don't get them. So <laughs> so it's well, like... You got them. You got them, yeah. Uh, now, I really wanted, you know, Greta Anthony Gerwig Hopkins. and, you know, yeah, Anthony Hopkins. Yeah. and Yeah, yeah. Um, 
but then when the script was finished and we were going out and you know going for financing andrews andrews you know i thought of andrews straight away um and then you just build the build the story from build the characters from there so the the casting from there and he's i spent a long time trying to work out who makes sense with each other who are you going to believe with each other um and i don't like to offer people roles i don't offer it to them but i want to sit down with them and say why do you want to do it you know what does it say to you what do you want to bring to it so i can just sort of understand why they're doing the film and then I really do think, I've said this before, but I really think casting is like you're running a dating agency. You're trying to get people that make sense with each other and are essentially going to fall in love with each other. Whether it's a mother and a son or a father and a son or a father and a, I mean, a husband and a wife, whatever it might be. So you're trying to work out who makes sense together. So did you try them together in a way? Did you ask them to be in a room and go through parts of the script to see the chemistry or it was already in your mind? It's sort of in my mind, and, and we did get together briefly, but it was in some like it was in a weird hotel room, the Ibis. <laughs> and I think Claire came in, and I was sitting there on like a double bed, and she's like, "What's happening? I don't think this is <laughs> this is not appropriate." Uh, and then the others came along, and it was fine, but it was a bit weird. Um, but we sort of talked through things together, and there were a few scenes that I thought were problematic, almost that I wasn't sure I'd cracked. And I would talk to though about those scenes with with the actors, um, but I don't like to go through it too much. I I feel like unless you're in the space and the camera is set up, I don't think for me personally I can't get a true um, handle on what's working and not and what's not working anyway. So I need to be on in the space that we're shooting in for, to know really. Talking about performances, I would like to speak if you don't mind a little bit about Andrew Scott performance. Because what's remarkable is that at the same time he depicts an adult who is falling in love, but also he's regressing into his childhood. How were you, how did you work together in the rehearsals to achieve this osmo- this weird osmosis? Yeah, it's funny. We we talked about it a bit, and I mean, all I can say is that we talked a lot about how the child within all of us is so close to the surface all the time. I don't care if you're like twenty, fifty, eighty the child is there all the time um and when i speak to people i know who are you know like 75 years old i'm like oh god that thing that happened to you when you were 12 or 10 that is all your whole personality is forged by that so it talks a lot about how easy it is to kind of oscillate between a parent i mean everyone goes back to their parents house at christmas you know you're like a teenager again yeah we totally regress yeah you totally regress so it just makes sense so i think you know, Andrew understood that and could access the child in him, which is essentially a vulnerability. He's accessing a really vulnerable part of him uh, and allowing that to come to the surface in all those scenes with the parents. Yeah. Um, it's amazing because some of these scenes could could easily be cringy, like the scene that where he's in the bed between the parents, but his performance is coming from such a real place that is believable in the end. Yeah, look, I I think with this film, there were so many scenes when I was writing them and even before shooting them thinking, this really, really could not work. Like, there's a lot of risk here. You know, you've got, like, the mother singing along to the Pet Shop Boys as a way to apologise to her child for what she hasn't said. And, you know, or him getting into bed with those ridiculous pyjamas that don't Or her fit. saying he, she likes a hairy chest. Or like saying that likes a hairy chest. <laughs> yeah, all of these things that really, really sort of don't... They could easily not work. But I just felt like they felt right, is all I can say. And, like, the pyjamas, which, you know, you laugh at because they look stupid and they are stupid. But it also speaks to how we want to be back in this space when we were younger, when we sort of wanted to feel protected but of course we're an adult now and the pyjamas don't fit and they look stupid, but we kind of still want to wear them. So I feel like at every stage it was like, but it's meaning something as well as being a little bit absurd. So the mother singing is absurd, but it's also kind of meaningful that she's singing along to that song and it's exactly what Adam wants to hear. Right. Um, At some point of the film, there is a conversation between Scott and Mescal and they're talking about their different experiences about uh, growing up being queer. Um, how intentional you were adding this into the script? Um, I like 
I mean, for me, there's so much like generational stuff in the movie. So there's like, you know, there's the parents. You even hear about their parents. And then there's Ad- um, Adam's generation and then Paul's. And I think in terms of like the gay experience, it's changed fundamentally for Harry's character than it was for Adam. Like Adam's obviously is closer to my age. And when you grew up uh, gay in the 80s, it was a pretty rough time to come into your sexuality for obvious, for lots of obvious reasons. Um and for a younger generation, it's a very different experience. They haven't had the burden of all that came in the 80s. And so I sort of wanted to make some comment about that, but also show how they share so much too. Like, not everything is different. They still are both outsiders within the world, even if the experience for a younger queer generation is very different. Um, yeah, because if I remember, he implies that there is chal- that there is still challenge to go. Yeah, and I, I think we... We sort of live in a society where everyone wants to sort of, for certain things, say that everything's got better and it's all okay now. And I just don't quite believe that's true. And it's not true because I, you know, I talk to younger people who are, you know, who even see this film when they're like 17 or 16 and they still are terrified to come out to their parents. So it's clearly not got to the stage where everyone feels completely fine about everything. And also, of course, depends where you live. Like it's very different if you live in like Islington or... You live in like Hull. That's bad about Hull. I'm sure Hull's <laughs> very liberal and open. Do I have time for one more question? Um, I want to ask about the process of adapting um, the book by Taishi Yamanda's novel, Strangers. What was your process adapting it to a screenplay? So I'm imagining no one's read the novel. Has anyone read the novel? No. Uh, it's very different. Like it, it, the, the central idea is the same. It is about a screenwriter who goes and sees his parents again after they died in, in a car accident. But the love, the romantic relationship is between a man and a woman. The woman is sort of like a evil spirit that sucks the life out of Adam and then he has to destroy her and blow her up. Very Japanese. There's a little bit of... Uh, but it's actually quite... It's a good... It's a very traditional ghost story in a really kind of interesting Japanese way. You know, how ghosts exist within Japanese culture is really interesting. But for me, it was like, okay, how can I make this feel right in the way that I understand ghosts, even? Um, and so then it became about what haunts me and what has had an effect on me growing up and into adulthood and all those kind of things and sort of turn it into a different type of ghost story. And so that was... The main thing in the, in the process was like, how much genre do I go into? How much do I hold that back? How much do I explain? How much do I not explain? Do I want you to think it's one thing or another thing? And so it was, it was, yeah, it took some time to get what I thought was the balance of it, sort of feeling real emotionally, even if logically it doesn't always make sense. Did you speak to him? So he died about... Three, uh, a month ago, six weeks ago, uh, just before the Biffers, whenever that was. So yeah, maybe it's a couple of months ago. He was eighty nine. He was he was you know he was he was old and he'd been ill for quite a long time. I never spoke to him. They did show him the film. Uh, he was in hospital at the time, and they showed it to him. And the family who've been really really supportive. You know, they were very supportive of the direction of it and everything. And you know they said that he, you know, usually he is asleep and he watched the whole film and his eyes are open, and they. They are sure that he liked it. I hope he liked it. And it wasn't just like, oh, God, <laughs> this is terrible. Um, but it is it's a really strange thing because I never spoke to him, obviously. But like somehow we're like connected through the adaptation and through his version of the story and my version of the story. And I don't know, I kind of love that somehow that we sort of have this weird connection, even though I've never met him or never spoken to him. It's a haunted story. Very, very last question. Why did you add to the title? The original novel, novel is called Strain strangers and you named it all of us strangers i think first of all if you go on imdb and put in strangers ah. there's like 57 <laughs> titles <laughs> if you begin with an a in your title <laughs> you get on a lot of the top of anything which is always quite handy but that wasn't obviously the reason uh but um i felt like i wanted the film to feel like it is a conversation with the audience, I suppose. And so I wanted whatever is personal for me in the story to also sort of connect with uh, the audience's personal too. And I felt like that the title somehow just meant that it was a film for all of us, I guess, and not just a story about 
one gay person living in London mm. who grew up in Sandersted. Interesting. Questions? Do we have, yeah. Hello. The mic, yeah. 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 Um, I don't know whether you meant it to be intentional, but as an older gay man who came out late, one of the things the film deals with is permission. Like you're looking for people because of the headwinds of the 80s in terms of the AIDS crisis and just the general... And it's alluded to in the film about everything's gay if you were at school at that particular point. I, mean, I don't know whether you were trying to address that by... Because the film does, for me, address the issue of I was looking for somebody to give me permission. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting way to put it. I feel like that so many people who grew up at that time and in that generation of like it, the pain of that. And I think it really was a trauma. It's been a trauma for a lot of people. Um, and that's in, stuck in so many of us. Um, you know, as it is to Adam, and it comes out, you know, it comes out so easy to come out. And I think the permission thing's quite interesting. I hadn't really thought of it like that, but there is a sense that there's a generation of us that, that needs people to say it's okay still, which is really sad that we actually still need that permission, especially from parents and loved ones. And I always do think that, you know, to be different from your parents in one fundamental way is a really, really difficult thing. And being gay it's almost like one of the only, unless your parents are gay, um, is a very singular experience because your parents are straight and you're not and you've got something that they are not. And there's not many other situations where that's the case. Maybe if you're, if you're black and your parents are white or you're adopted or maybe you're deaf and your parents can hear, maybe there's similar things there. But I think it's, it causes a quite a lot of um, struggle for people within those families. Question itself, when he said, oh, I don't probably don't need one because I'm loud. Um, with we were a, recording it. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. About the music, when you said that the mother communicated to him at the Christmas tree to say apologize, all the other music, was that in your head when you were writing, or did you write and then add the music? Only because I don't know anything. I'm curious. Yeah, the music was all in my, I mean, it's all in the script. There was all scripted songs. So um, we got the rights to them before we, before we even started shooting. And there were songs that were important to me growing up and songs I loved and still love. And, you know, for me, pop music has an amazing like ability to drag you back to when you first listen to a song. And it is like time travel. And, and also pop music, especially for younger people, it's sort of, I think it's so important for allowing young people to understand big broad emotions love and loss and pain and all those kind of things and i'm sure that's why teenagers adore it so much because teenagers don't know what the fuck is going on like your head is like wow i don't know what's happening and i know that like my understanding of life even whether it's politics or you know i used to love the house martins who were you know essentially a bunch of marxists and i'm convinced <laughs> that my political views have come from not listening to house martin songs um and so i feel like pop music is so integral to sort of young you know young people hello hi it's just a simple question um would you say the movie is more about uh, grief or more about love uh, I think it's def for me. It's definitely about uh, love. I mean, I think it's about how, uh, in the end, love is the thing that can soften all of those very difficult things that we go through. Whether it's grief or loss of any kind, or just sadness or loneliness, whatever it is, love is the thing that's not necessarily the solution uh, or changes everything, um, but it does make everything a little bit easier if you can find it, I suppose, is what I'm sort of saying. And that the love is about, you know, what you can give to someone else, what, how you can comfort other people, like a parent does to a child. I think in relationships we forget that's also what love has to be about as well, looking after the person that we're with and making sure that, that they feel safe when, you know, they need us to, to make them feel safe. Well, um, a beautiful film. Thank you. Um, well, the film deals with very personal issues, and I want to know how 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 do you how do you find the distance to have to still have perspective to go through all of these things? Yeah, I don't know really. It's like when I'm I when I'm writing, I try and forget or ignore the fact that it might ever become a film. So because I think that would terrify me too much and I would worry too much about 
what I was putting in that was personal and what wasn't and all those kind of things. Um, and the truth is I don't have perspective. I just am trying to find the things that are personal to me that I think will also be personal to other people. And I think that sort of gives it an element of perspective. But it is, it is, it's a strange one because, you know, I had a screening in Brighton this weekend and lots of like my family were there and my aunts and uncles who all knew the house because that was my house that I used to live in. And so they all remember that house and they sent me loads of pictures today of me around the Christmas tree which is in exactly the same position that it is in the film and in the garden and all those kind of things. So I, I think I, I didn't quite realise also the effect this film would have on other people who are also in my life that lived there and knew me and all those kind of things. So it's been, um, that probably goes a bit away from your question, but it's still, it's, it's a hard thing. I think it's all right to not be able to get too much distance, I don't know. Hi. Uh, you mentioned you were worried that quite a lot of the scenes um, might not work and they might end up too cringy or something. Do, do you find that it took a lot of takes a lot of the time or did Paul and Andrew tend to get it right first time? I think all of the actors really did get it. I mean, look, they don't necessarily get it right first time, uh, but they, <laughs> they, they understood like tonally uh, the type of performance it, it needed to be. Um, and that's not an easy thing. Like, I think you all have to understand together what it is that the tone of the piece is. And every performance needs to get to that tone and create the same kind of tone. And they were all so good about knowing that if it felt, it had to just feel genuine, I suppose. And, you know, when I'm in the edit, I have to work out what is the moment that it feels entirely real. And, of course, there are moments when someone, an actor, brings a tear to their eye and you're like, well, that's not real. And then there's other, and it's like, well, this is rubbish. And I can't stand seeing someone emotional on screen when you're like, nah, there's absolutely nothing there. You stop it, just just stop, just don't do it. Um, so it's just about being aware of like when something real is happening and you feel it on the day, like you can feel it. You can be like, that's, that's the take that it's gonna be. But I don't shoot too much. I don't shoot lots and lots of takes. I keep it pretty minimal, keep it pretty, like, I can't, I don't think we ever did more than four takes on something, maybe five takes or something, unless it's a longer shot when you sometimes need to take more, because you know you're not going to cut, but, um, yeah. One more question. There was a lady over there. <coughs> Just pass that along for me. Cheers. Hi. Um, that was wonderful, thank you. Um, I'd love to hear about your process of translating it from the s from the page to the screen. And was there anything that kind of developed in the making that you weren't expecting, or yeah, just that process? I think there's always like it's it's basically you know you you start with a vague idea of what it is you're trying to express. I suppose is the best way to put it, and then you're constantly surprised until you get to the very last moment when you can't edit anymore, and that's it. And even doing the sound mix, there's always things that you're like, oh, that's appearing now that's interesting, or a sound effect that suddenly brings something to life in a way you hadn't thought about. So it's so funny when you make a film because it's every little tiny thing has such a big effect. Um, I was talking about this the other day. It's such a weird thing making films. Like, you know, the scene when he goes out in the field and the dad appears for the first time. Like, it's very sort of tranquil and beautiful. The reality of shooting that scene is we've got two gigantic wind machines <laughs> blasting like a sort of helicopter taking off so I can have the, the grasses to, like, waver and then slow down and stop when he opens his eyes. Now, it's insane, really, when you're making a film because when you're shooting it, you're like, is this gonna be it? is this gonna work and then you start to build it up again and you know you get the right color grade and you get the right sound effects and suddenly the the thing that you've been trying to achieve like you're like oh yeah it does work and even for an audience you might not notice those things and it's so much of it works subconsciously and you're just like oh something's happening here but all of those things are little bits of dis small decisions that you've made to try and try to bring a scene to life so i mean for me the thing that i'm most uh, pleased about which is always a surprise is that it it seems to like make you feel something and that's 
you know that's the thing I'm always trying to do and you always just hope that you're trying to get that um and I don't even mean like cry or anything it's not like I'm trying to make people cry or whatever that might be but you just want someone to feel something you know and that that's always a nice surprise when you think oh yeah I think I've, I think I've done that Okay, a couple of questions. Um, there was an incredibly strong sense of place, which you haven't mentioned so far. How important was it to you that the sense of London and the trains and the Croydon should be really at the centre of the film? Yeah, look, it was really, really important to me. Um, and, I, 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 and more than anything, I, because the film essentially exists in this strange metaphysical space let's say i also need you to feel grounded in a real reality but also be slightly shifted from reality so you know nobody's on their phones there's still it doesn't actually feel like real life but you sort of recognize the apartment block and you recognize that view of london but you're not quite sure where it's from and and that contradiction and that contrast between that tower and then back home um, and when I was writing, I knew that I wanted that childhood home to be the place I lived and that whole area is where I used to live. And more than it just wanting to be about my childhood, it was more about I understand that place and I understand what it feels like. And and that to me was the key is to, like, to make it as specific as possible um, so everybody can sort of bring their own specificity to it. Like, you know, things like getting the wallpaper right on the wall that wood, wood chip wallpaper that everyone knows of a certain generation and luckily it doesn't does it still exist i don't think it exists anymore does it still exist it's more of a praise rather than a question maybe i get to a question at the end um <laughs> it's very nice the way it's done um but it's it's, I had a. I don't know if you, it was intentional or not. The feeling of when the film opened had a feel of the shining, and then when he goes to the parents, mum mentioned, "Are you famous as Stephen King?" And it's uh, so perhaps that. But also, when you mention grief or love, it's it goes together. You can't feel grief without knowing love, and the other way around. You, yeah. But uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think that's a really, uh, I really like that because it is true. It's like it's uh, when you, if you're overcome by grief, it's often easy to forget that that is why you're grieving because you experienced love. Otherwise, you wouldn't be grieving. Um, and I think that that is quite helpful in the midst of grief to realize this only exists because you were lucky enough to have found whatever that and parental, whoever it might be, parental and romantic love that you found it. So. I think they're so wrapped up together and so vital to keep together. Um, and I did love Stephen King as a kid a lot. So, I, you know, he was a great writer, is a great writer. Like, he managed to, to tell stories that had a strange, obviously, supernatural horror or whatever, it was, but still feel grounded. Um, and I kind of love that the mum liked reading Stephen King. What's your favourite book of Stephen King? Sorry. I mean, I liked all the ones like I was reading them in the eighties, so it was like Shining and It and Christine and Different Seasons, which is a collection of four short stories. Uh, but yeah, I was I was I liked them a lot when I was young. Great. Well, thank you very much, Andrew, for this gem of a film. Um, it's been amazing. I think uh, I mean it's killing in the box office. We are pushing people away, and <laughs> it's re really. Really, and there are people that are seeing it for the second and third time and always discovering something. So, I think it would be a future classic. Well done, congratulations! Thank you very much. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.